third session um, in this in this streamed um, streamed session. Um, it's from three uh, film conservators at Natonga Sound and Vision, um, talking to us about two case studies of, of their film scanning and, and conservation work. Um, so I'd like to welcome Leslie, Richard, and Gareth to the stage for the session. Thank you. Kia ora koutou. <coughs> My name is Leslie Lewis. I'm a moving image conservator at Natonga Sound and Vision. Uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity to speak to you here today. Um, I'm here with Richard Faulkner and Gareth Evans, representing the Five Strong Film Preservation Team at Nautonga Sound and Vision. So we're not getting a lot done over there today since we're all in front of you. Uh, Nautonga is an organization committed to collecting, preserving, and making New, Zealand, New Zealand's audiovisual cultural heritage available to both local and worldwide audiences. Our collection has film, video, audio, born digital works, as well as documentation and props. Uh, with regards to film, we hold everything from New Zealand's oldest surviving nitrate film, which is 120 years old this month, um, to digital intermediates that were just produced a few years ago. There are titles that were made by well-known production companies, government, regional organizations, as well as independent filmmakers and artists. We also have a large portion of our film collection is made up of what we call personal records, which are largely amateur produced titles and home movies documenting the experiences of every and everyday lives of New Zealanders over the past century. Our team focuses on material that originates on film, specifically its conservation, so caring for the original material in order to safeguard it for as far into the future as possible, so we always have something original to go back to and preservation, which is creating new copies on stable media to ensure a long-term survival and to create accessibility for as wide an audience as possible. Uh, the past couple of decades have, the couple of decades, past couple of years, there's been an explosion in the amount of audience members that we can reach and we need better uh, copies that we can give them. And one of the ways that we are now able to do that um, is through digital preservation. In the past, these preservation, uh, preservations were done photochemically, which created new copies on film stock through traditional printing and developing methods. Uh, over the last 15 years or so, the film has seen a dramatic shift towards digital preservation. This involves scanning rolls of film frame by frame at extremely high resolution. Uh, for about 10 minutes worth of content in a film, there are 16,000 frames, which each have to be dealt with individually. Uh, we do this uh, in order to create preservation elements that are of comparable quality and detail to that which is achievable using film stock. And that's been something that uh, really just in the past couple of years has become something where we're happy with the result that we're able to get and are more, much more comfortable calling it preservation. All of the post-production work is conducted digitally and the workflow adopted, adopted by Natanga and most other film archives at this point. The end results uh, and products remain entirely within the digital realm. We have no analog uh, output, which for anyone who's a traditional conservator is very <coughs> nerve wracking, but maybe that's not the group here. Uh, given the wide range of materials that we deal with on an everyday basis, accomplishing these goals requires highly specialized knowledge of both the original characteristics of the artifacts as well as the technology used to preserve them. Today we'll be presenting two case studies that are particularly useful in highlighting different aspects of the digital preservation process. While the original format and content of the films in these two projects are quite different, You'll see how we use the same overall process, whatever the title, adapting it to meet the requirements of the particular source material. First, Richard will introduce you to the works of 1960s amateur filmmaker Hilda Brody Smith. And then Gareth is going to talk about the landmark 1980 documentary, Bastion Point, Day 507. Richard. Thanks, Leslie, and uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, first up, I'd like to make a very quick disclaimer that uh, we actually don't have time to show the works of Hilda, so anybody who's just come along for the free movie, I'm very sorry, but I'm not going to be able to show you very much. Mm -hmm. um, so one difference between Nga Taonga, uh, Sound and Vision and many other archives in New Zealand and around the world is that we accept deposits of um, uh, domestic personal records and basically home movies in various formats, particularly um, small gauge film collections. Um, our definition of small gauge film includes uh, regular 
eight millimeter um, film and super eight and um, nine point five millimeter, which is a bit more obscure. Um, and it's kind of interesting by virtue of having the uh, perforations in between the frames of the film, which can spell disaster when it goes off the sprockets because they go straight through your picture. Um, so these films offer a, a really interesting personal side to our history, uh, often spanning really long periods. Um, in one deposit you can see um, like maybe a baby grow into a toddler and then from there um, go to school and then even into like teenage life and adulthood, um, going off to work and getting married and sometimes even beyond. Um, and, and, and they're always shot through the lens, uh, dictated and told through the lens of what the filmmaker deemed worthy of shooting and um, actually taking the time to edit um, and sort of also through the lens of um, the, the context of their time as well. Um, so that can make for some really interesting material, but of course for every um, nicely shot, uh, carefully edited film, there's a dozen scratch, scratchy looking badly filmed kittens playing in a dark room that's scratchy and impossible to look at. Um, many dozens, unfortunately. Um, by the 1960s, though, there many skilled amateur filmmakers were coming together in sort of amateur movie groups and cine clubs and comparing their skills and sharing notes and celebrating each other's works in um, groups like the Otago um, Cine Photographic Club. Um, one such avid filmmaker was a Scottish immigrant named Hilda Brodie Smith. Um, who, uh, with her husband Alan, made several films, many of which have been deposited with Nga Taonga Sound of Vision. Um, this pair went well beyond the realms of scratchy cat uh, films and recording glimpses of family holidays. Um, they wrote, shot and edited um, fiction and non-fiction films, um, complete with well-lit interior shots, as you can see here, um, complex and camera optical effects, um, and even produced um, synchronised soundtracks with um, sound effects, music and voiceovers and even synchronised post sort of um, voiceovers and um, yeah, all, all full nine yards, uh, really impressive, which is very rare for um, personal records uh, from any period really. Um, and so with that uh, collection having been last transferred in the 1990s using um, the technology of that period, we decided that given the interest of the material, it was worth um, completely uh, retransferring the the entirety of the 15 uh, home movies that were in the collection. Um, so the first stage of preservation is to acquire the source materials from the vaults and ensure they're appropriately uh, housed and in good cans and whatnot, assess their physical condition and prepare them for digitization. In the case of this collection, the film's a regular eight millimeter color reversal. Um, with mag stripe on the film edge. Um, so uh, Adam briefly mentioned um, mag stripe. In the case of um, eight millimeter, it's about it's a ferrous oxide um, tape, which is about a millimeter, just slightly less than a millimeter wide, which was actually adhered to the finished cut film after all of the editing was done, and then you would dub your sound onto that. Um, so that can make it uh, pretty fragile, um, especially 50 years later. Uh, also retrieved from another vault is the, um, the master quarter inch reel to reel sound tape from which that mag stripe was dubbed onto. Um, the film is expected by uh, conservators at Nataonga and who check the method and the integrity of each handmade splice and look for damage that could affect um, the integrity of the film and the digitization process. Um, due to the fragility of the mag stripe um, on these particular films, the normal cleaning processes of um, particle transfer rolling and uh, cloth cleaning the entire film uh, were deemed inappropriate and so they were spot cleaned using cotton buds and um, isopropyl alcohol and perchloroethylene um, when necessary. Um, and even if the motion is in good condition, as you can see here, the image looks quite good when it's properly illuminated. Um, when you actually look at the base of the same material, it's very, very worn because, of course, with where the films were popular with the family, they would be yanked out at every holiday and when some poor sucker came over to the house and they'd run it through the projector again, which would wear it out. Um, so our conservators would uh, record their findings in the materials metadata records of the database and um, with that pass the physical items on to us for digitisation. 
So until recently we'd only been able to digitise small gauge films using ELMOs, which are a brand of adapted projector um, which basically projects the film and records video of the projection um, using a camera. Um, Hilda's film uh, collection had been transferred using this method, recording to DV cam in the 1990s, which was an adequate format at that point 15 years ago, but with a resolution of 720 by 576 pixels, it's barely a quarter of today's sort of broadcast standards uh, of 1080 by 1920 as kind of an entry level for broadcast. Um, so this time around the films were digitised on the MWA flash scan, which uh, Adam also showed a brief slide of, uh, which is driven by uh, Mac Pro. Um, we purchased that in 2011, um, and this is able to concurrently record a 24-bit uh, 48 kilohertz wave audio file and create a 10-bit uh, DPX image sequence or a, a quick time of sort of uh, similar sort of size. Um, but still only maxing out at a resolution of 1280 by 720 uh, pixels. So these modern scanners have um, a few big advantages over their older counterparts. Um, they no longer use sprockets uh, to advance the film at all, instead using a rubber capstan, as you can see with a little arrow there, um, and that just pulls the film along under its own uh, tension. Uh, so there's no risk or a massively reduced risk of it sort of being damaged by sort of any kind of malfunction with the transporter or a film splice breaking or something like that. Um, so using a laser shone through the perforations, um, the scanner is able to rack the film correctly into frame as it um, transports. And um, the film is illuminated using LEDs uh, through a diffuse sort of light source, um, which doesn't heat up the film really uh, anything like enough to risk damaging the film through heat or like melting it as you've seen old films melting in front of the the, um, the lamp and to record the mag stripe the film is run through a very small specialized uh, magnetic reader which digitizes the sound to 24 bit uh, 48 kilohertz wave audio so after loading the film uh, the operator moves to the software interface which uh, where this film is the scanner is calibrated to the film and first the camera is focused on the emulsion and then the frame is cropped to overscan the image a little. So we, um, here's an example of a frame overscanned. Um, we, we tend to scan just outside the image and a little bit into the perf so that um, if the film does still jiggle a little bit in the, in the, um, in the frame then you know that it's not going to jiggle out of, out of rack and you're always going to get the entire image. Um, later on it's, it's cropped to look something more like that um, for sort of uh, post-production purposes. Um, the, once it's cropped and focused, the, each frame is digitised by illuminating the film with a diffuse light source and capturing the resulting image with a 3CCD sensor and saving it to disk in real time as a DPX image in a designated uh, sequence folder. The software is able to automatically detect the film's density and colour and can adjust the illumination of the film in order to correct it on the fly, uh, which it can do, but it happens over about two or three frames. And if you just set it at the start of the film and let it roll through all the shots, um, you do see a little ramping over the first few frames of each shot. So in terms of a digital preservation, it's pretty much compromised. Um, so in order to obtain an image as close as possible to the original, each film was scanned um, over several passes. Um, the first pass is done at the film's intended playback speed of 16.6 .6 frames per second, which was a sort of a standard of uh, small gauge. And the entire film is digitised just in one go, as well as the magstripe sound. Um, this creates a complete and final wave file um, of the magstripe sound as, as per the original in one piece and a matching video which we can use as a reference with which uh, to compare subsequent shots uh, for conforming the final DPX. From there the films are scanned again shot by shot to reproduce the film's original colour as closely as possible while avoiding the introduced uh, transitions that I described earlier. Due to die fade in the emulsion or shifts in exposure, each shot uh, has to be checked to ensure as much information as possible is obtained without losing information in the shadows or the highlights. Uh, one drawback of this particular machine is that it can add digital noise in uh, in areas of low light uh, if you push the gamma or the mids um, to try and bring out detail in the shadows um, which it's <coughs> kind of hard to explain but I've zoomed in an image uh, a frame here and so this is um, one frame 
and hopefully we can see it here, but if I um, just jiggle between these two uh, frames, it's exactly the same frame, but you can see two screenshots of the same frame. You can sort of see some noise jumping around, and that's caused by um, a gamma shift. Um, the, the sensor just creates noise in, in that sort of range when you push it too hard. So uh, in order to work around that, we try and keep the gamma, gamma at a pretty low level and then um, make those gamma corrections as a post-production uh, correction. Uh, let's see. So um, when we're satisfied that the colour is as good as, as possible, the scanner is launched and it can scan at basically real time or up to 25 frames a second, which is um, significantly faster than real time for, for these films. Um, the given colour setting might be fine to actually cover the entire film, just locked off on the one setting, or it might need changes for every single shot in the film. Um, so when you do hit a spot where it obviously goes out of range, you stop it and then you go back and make it make a tweak to the um, colour settings and then go back a few frames before and start again. And you basically repeat that process until you've got every shot in the film in a separate little DPX sequence. So. Um, Upon completing the digitization of um, the raw scan, um, we can format using uh, uh, nonlinear editing software. Um, with this, we use, um, for this purpose, we use uh, DaVinci Resolve. Um, and first, we stick the entire reference scan uh, that we got in one pass in the WAV file on a timeline. And at that point, we can um, compare the mag stripe sound which we got in that scan to the reel-to-reel -reel sound which we've sent out of um, out of the building to be digitized at another place because that's not something that we can do at this point. And um, we can compare which one we prefer. And unfortunately for me, we decided in most cases that um, we preferred the reel-to-reel -reel sound for various sort of, it's a generation earlier and it's just sort of superior for various reasons and sound quality. Um, because we also discovered at that point that uh, mag tape can stretch. Anybody who's dealt with reel-to-reel -reel audio might have noticed that. If you record it twice, you'll get two different length recordings. Um, so when you're trying to sync that to um, a DPX sequence, which doesn't stretch, then uh, you're going to have issues. So what we had to do there was um, we had to lay down the sound next to that mag stripe, digitize, the digitized mag stripe recording, and um, just carefully sort of adjust the speed of playback um, to the reel-to-reel -reel version to match the mag stripe, which um, with that sorted, uh, we could really focus on conforming the picture. So each rescan shot was placed onto the track above it and moved into sync with the original reference scan uh, and the excess frames were removed. And by checking the start and end frames of each shot as it's placed and trimmed, you can confirm each frame is present and the, um, and the shot is complete. And double check the colour um, before exporting the whole thing as a new DPX sequence to be archived as a digital preservation master. The master sequence is cropped um, and then um, you've removed that overscan and you can export a broadcast friendly um, sort of frame rate version, uh, say 24 or 25 um, frames per second with frames repeated to emulate the uh, original playback speed. The videos that we export are a ProRes 42HQ and um, that's for use in editing and broadcast and a highly compressed H.264 for quick reference and internet streaming. Uh, the final preservation DPX sequence, WAVE and ProRes files are accessioned into our database and archived to du duplicate uh, LTO tapes and stored in separate locations uh, while the H.264 viewing file is saved to a local server for quick reference by staff and researchers. Um, yeah, I don't have time, unfortunately, to show you an example of her work um, very fully, but I can show you a quick comparison of um, the old Elmo version uh, compared to um, the new version. So this is uh, coming from a DV cam transfer, and you can see the actual lines of the video sensor in there, and this is a flash cam version. And you can actually see the grain and the um, emulsion, which is a nice thing to see after seeing a sort of blurry soft version with lines. You can also see the cropping is uh, much improved with the with the later version. <coughs> the DV cam uh, Elmo version is really zoomed in quite probably too far. This is a really cool um, little 18-minute uh, film about um, the development of Porirua in the 1960s, which is probably one of the most fulsome records of that development, which is um, really cool. 
So the workflow um, I just described is specific to the way that the MWA flash scan works and um, every machine, as you probably realise, requires a different approach and yields different results. Um, Adam was just telling you about the, um, the scan station um, that we've recently obtained and um, that's, that's a, a fantastic machine and of course we've discovered now that we can actually um, transfer 8 mil and um, Super 8 on that as well as well as 16 and 35 and that can output um, up to 5k and down res even with um, 8 mil you can do a 5k scan of 8 mil if you want and then um, down sample that to 1080 or whatever other um, uh, resolution is, is useful to your workflow um, and it can also export um, in the one pass you can colour grade it and get rid of all of um, your files exported in one pass which is really useful um, so yeah at this point I'll hand over to Gareth to um, talk about best in point cheers Hi, my name is Gareth Evans. Um, I work with Richard in the scanning department. I'm going to talk about Bastion Point, day 507. Hopefully a few of you guys have seen it. Uh, it taking place almost exclusively over a single day. The film is a documentary about the occupation of Bastion Point and the struggle for Māori land rights in 1977 New Zealand. Directed by Merita Mita and co-directed by Leon Nabi, the film is a form of observational cinema with a minimum of narration to convey a compelling story. With its use of different cameras and film stocks, it presented a particular challenge for digital restoration. One that highlights the symbi symbiotic relationship between archival work and film post-production. Like post-production, we use a workflow which consists of four distinct phases, ingest, conform, color grading and mastering. At the end of each phase is quality control or QC. Each and every phase is followed by at least one QC, preferably involving two people. We sit down and watch a project from start to finish looking for any technical faults or anything that could be improved to maintain the integrity of a project. This must occur at the end of each phase before the film moves on to the next. Ingest is when you take the physical version of the film and create a new digital master or raw scan. With Bastion, we used the original camera negative, 16mm A and B roll, and scanned it on our ARRI scanner. The ARRI is the flash scan's big brother, powerful but ponderous. Our ARRI scanner works at about 5 to 3 frames per second, or for an average of about 2 frames per second. Compare that to a feature film which plays at 24 frames per second. Powerful because each frame can be scanned at up to 6K in resolution. What makes the ARRI unique as a scanner is that it can expose each frame twice. This is to gain as much information from the picture as possible. It exposes for the shadow detail and the highlights before combining the two to create a single logarithmic or log DPX file. So I'll just play a video. Uh, this has been exposed for the shadow details and then it will show you what it looks like when it exposes for the highlights. And then the final one is the combined image. Each frame of the film gets one DPX file. Bastion Point is about 37,000 frames long, resulting in a folder containing 37,000 DPX files. This forms what we refer to as the raw scan. The raw scan is one of the most important elements of digital restoration. It becomes the new master copy from which all subsequent versions are derived. It is incredibly important that the raw scan be as perfect as possible. This is why QC is so important. The raw scan of Bastion Point actually failed its first, first QC. The large variety of stocks meant some shots fell outside of what was technically acceptable. Some had blacks that were crushed, others had highlights that were blown out. To correct this issue, the entire film was scanned again. This time we calibrated the ARRI for every single shot, all 366 of them. This ex exponentially extended the ingest time but resulted in a raw scan that passed QC and met our technical standards. After the ingest phase, we conform the film. Richard talked about this in relation to Hilda Brody. The process remains basically the same for every film. You take a raw scan and edit it to match the original film. In this case, the original film was that top line, that large clip. Everything else underneath that is every single shot. With a project like Bastion, we used an old viewing print as reference. We copied this exactly. 
Without a print to refer to, it's easy to miss a cross dissolve between shots or opticals that might, might have been added later. By using a print as a reference, we could guarantee that the new version was close to the original as possible. Once again, the conform film is QC'd and then moves on to the next phase. Color grading. This phase encompasses a large portion of re the restoration process. It will often include things like stabilization, cropping, and the removal of dust and dirt. It is where the line between archiving and post-production completely blurs. As I've said earlier, we archive the raw scan as our master. We are now moving towards creating a new version of the film, one that, would be sorry, one that can be viewed and appreciated by a modern audience. To do this, we use the same tools available to a modern filmmaker. This includes color grading. Color grading is performed by someone who is often referred to as a colorist. It is the colorist who goes through the film and gives it its final look. As you have seen, the ingested log image is often flat and boring. It is the colorist who goes through every shot and manipulates it to look aesthetically pleasing while still maintaining a technical standard. I'll just give you a quick clip that shows the comparison of the raw to the graded. The role grew out of what was previously called color timing. Color timing began as a photochemical process. The look of a film was manipulated by dipping it into a developer bath. The longer a film was in the bath, the darker the image. A short amount of time resulted in a lighter image. Through this basic form of color timing, a film was manipulated to correct technical problems or through creative decisions. From there, color grading evolved into the manipulation of light using filters in the printing process. Color graders were able to manipulate RGB and YCM values on a shot-by-shot -shot basis. Now color grading is performed using digital tools like DaVinci Resolve. We often refer to them as colorists as their role now encompasses far more than just the manipulation of RGB values. With Bastion Point, the color grading process was incredibly important. We had no reference for how the color should look. The prints had faded and gone magenta. The only other digital version had been transferred in the 90s and the color was washed out. To help mitigate this, we invited Leon Nabi, the co-director, to attend the grading sessions. He was surprised how much we were able to get out of this new raw scan. With the notes he provided, we were able to complete the film without a color reference while still re remaining true to the original intent. During the grading process, some cigarette burns were removed. That's the round mark there on the, on the left. These are circular marks that denote the beginning and end of a reel or edit. They were often used in news to aid, aid the live broadcast of film. In the case of Bastion Point, they occurred at the beginning and the end of a few shots. Modern audiences can find these quite distracting. Using the tools available now, it is easy to completely remove them. When we did, something didn't feel quite right. As an archive, it is our mission to preserve an artifact exactly how it was intended. Although we could remove them seamlessly, we ended up leaving the cigarette burns exactly how we found them. We even, no, even though this could be distracting to a modern audience. Once the film was graded and QC'd, we began the final stage of mastering. A new DPX sequence was created with the graded, graded footage. From this, a mezzanine, quick time, and viewing copy were created. All new versions were QC'd before they were accessioned and became part of the archive. We had the honor of presenting the finished film to the family of Merita Mita. At the end, her daughter stood up and gave us some background on what went into the making of the film. All the different stocks and cameras were the, were the result of them big, borrowing, and creatively commandeering any gear they could. Some of the footage was taken from news coverage, and that had been gained by very creative means. These sections of the film were marked by the use of cigarette burns. With this revelation, the cigarette burns now take on a whole new meaning, one that would have been lost if we had used all the techniques available within modern post-production. The line between archiving and post-production must be, I mean, post-production might be blurring, but the aim remains the same. It was a poignant reminder that as an archive, it is important we find a balance between modern post-production tools and remaining true to the original intent of a film. This last clip I have is a comparison of the previous version that was available in our new, uh, new restored version.
Thank you.